Welcome to Bitter Reality Brewing. Today we've got something really special. I get so many questions I see out there and they're asking everybody, hey, how do you do the brew house efficiency? Hey, my brew house efficiency is this. Hey, what's this? How can I fix this? I'm doing this video to help people because had I seen a video like this when I first started worrying about brew house efficiencies, I would have been very thankful and it would have been very beneficial to me. So I definitely want to share that. I'm a home brewer like you. I'm not a chemist and we're going to touch on some chemistry things, but I'll make sure I only touch on them. If you're a chemist out there, feel free to share your opinions, uh, share your knowledge. Uh, not a problem. So this is going to be the six ways of maximizing your brew house efficiencies. What is a brew house efficiency? Okay. And we're relating to beer here going from the beginning of your malts to, and I mean the, your malts, all the way to going into the fermenter. There are other ones, there's mash efficiencies, there is measured efficiencies, but this is maximizing your brew house efficiencies. Don't forget, like, subscribe. Thank you again for all the sharing, it's been huge. Definitely appreciate it. We're gonna touch a little bit for some of my Anvil brewers out there on a way to increase their efficiency a little bit too. It'll be under one of the six topics that we're going to cover anyways. So it's kind of related, very related. Actually, it is related. If you are a new brewer, never brewed, and I mean new, like you haven't even done five batches, I'm not going to say stop watching, but take this with a grain of salt. Do not get hung up about brew house efficiencies. If you've ever heard the term ignorance is bliss, I probably had, had the ignorance about my brew house efficiencies for the first 40, 50 brews easy. And I was good with that. Just imagine you take a bunch of starchy grain, you put it in hot water, it comes out as sugar. You're good, let it go. Don't worry about it. Don't get hung up on brew house efficiencies. Please don't get hung up on it. Just understand the concepts so that maybe you can help with your steps in learning and understanding of brewing before you get focused on brew house efficiencies. So without any further ado, we will start. Okay, very first, out of the six, we're gonna do two, because they're directly related to each other. pH and temperature, and these are easy ones, most people have heard these, but pH and temperature of your mash. The pH and temperature of your mash have a direct effect on the efficiencies of enzyme activity. Bingo, that's how we get sugar. We have starch, we have enzymes, but we have to get those enzymes to wake up and start doing stuff, and when they do, they help to create the sugar, whether it's fermentable or unfermentable, it helps to convert or hydrolyze those starches and sugars. Compared to wine, cider, or other sweet sugary fruit-based fermentables, beer starts with malts, and malts are full of starches instead of sugars, like all those other sugary things I mentioned. So the enzymes that are found in these malts break these starches down into fermentable sugars. But you have to understand that the enzymes that contribute to this are directly impacted by the pH and the temperature. So you have things like alpha amylase, beta amylase, alpha gluconase, there's a lot of them. And each one has its own pro and con, should we say, but something to be aware of. So number one, pH. If your pH is too high or even too low, it can cause the enzymes to slow or even stop and become inactive. pH can be adjusted with acid malts or acidulated malts. Brewing salts, most brewing salts contribute a little bit to the acid. There's a few that contribute to the base for alkalinity. Um, also, you have lactic acid, phosphoric acid. Those all can be added and contribute, and some go a long ways, so don't go crazy. But the current acceptable recommendation for pH during a mash is between 5.2 and 5.6. You can get something like, um, I think it's Dr. pH meter or something like that. Very good. You've got to keep calibrating these things to make sure you're dead on and you're not too far off. They take a minute to measure. You also want, if you decide to get one, make sure it has auto temperature correction, ATC. That way you don't have to worry about the temperatures too much and it can calculate the pH based on that temperature. Just something to be aware of. So number two, temperature. There are different enzymes released at different temperatures. And Here's something to be aware of. All these enzymes have their own personal range. They like it a little warmer and a little hotter. Well, the key is, is that at the lower range for these enzymes, whatever their range may be, you get activity, but less activity. And instead of being a bell curve, it's kind of more like a tidal wave. As it gets warmer and warmer, they become more and more active and they 
they really just start going nuts and doing their job. But, and that's something to be aware of because I used to try to hit the middle of the road on my mash temperatures and really you want to be closer to the high without being too high. But once you hit that peak, they sharply decelerate or even stop. So be careful on your temperatures. You want to be in the range and if you can be on the higher side, you're going to get more enzyme activity and more of those starches being broken down into sugars or converted into sugars. But once you hit that peak, they'll decelerate or even stop. Once you exceed their range and you've been up there, I mean, a little spike, uh, you might be okay. But if you've been up there for a while, don't expect to come back down and see any or very little if, if you see any enzyme activity. Something to be aware of. I mentioned the temperatures just so you're aware of them and then we'll go on to number three. But between 86 Fahrenheit, 126 Fahrenheit, which is 30 to 30 to 52 Celsius, beta gluconase um, helps dissolve starches, uh, things like that, but it can create bad tasting acids at very low temperatures if you exceed, you know, or even a stuck mash exceeding more than 15 minutes. So this the second one is one I had a problem with where I was doing some step mashes with some wheat beers and I kept getting this off kind of almost like eating paper at the end and nobody could tell me what it was and I figured it out myself. But 50 to 55 Celsius, 122 to 131 Fahrenheit, protease and peptidase um, breaks down proteins including it also helps with clearer beer, better head retention. It produces free amino nitrogen which is good for health yeast. Problem. You get too much free amino nitrogen and you get off flavors. Bing, 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 bing. That's what I had. So it's something to be aware of. I just avoid step mashes now, unless I really, really need to do one, then I will do it, but I will keep it very minimal, about 10 minutes and rock on. I don't want to be there very long because you got to remember your temperatures are coming up and when you have to go up, it's going to stay there a little longer than you thought. Um, the one that most of us go for, which gives us beta amylase, is 62 to 67 Celsius, 143 to 152 Fahrenheit. It produces fermentable sugars. Yeah, that's what we want. Um, great for dry beers too. But those fermentable sugars are usually a little less flavorful than between 154 to 162 Fahrenheit or 71 to 72 Celsius alpha amylase. Alpha amylase produces primarily non-fermentable sweet sugars, which have a lot of flavor to them, but are non-fermentable. So it's something to be aware of. You can look that information up on the net anywhere. Um, I think it's like mash temperature chart just to find that one. That was my little search words and brought it right up. Number three, this is a double-edged sword, grain crush. Grain crush, grain crush, grain crush till I'm blue in the face. I use a 0 0.0375 of an inch according to my cereal crusher. That's what it says based on the little arrows. So the finer the crush, the better the efficiencies usually, but higher chance for a stuck or even a packed mash, which could reduce in lower efficiencies. If you're doing brew in a bag, a lot of people do a very fine crush. If you're doing something like the anvil, some people use a more coarse crush than I do, but I like in my anvil, I use a 0 .3, 0 0.0375. And it's what I used to use in my grandfather too. So it works well for me, at least for most of the all-in-one electric brewing systems. So something to be aware of and to take into consideration. Number four. This one is one of the two that I don't hear people talking about. Flow of the water or wort. And what I mean by flow, think of a river or a stream. It takes the path of least resistance. It doesn't say, hey, today I'm going over here. It just says, this is the easiest way to flow. This is where I'm going. If I have my grains over here and my mash over here, I'm not getting anything out of these grains unless they get put in there. Same thing with the crush. I mean, if it's not crushed, you might not get any of anything out of it. So keep in mind things that impact this directly. Rice hulls. Remember, rice hulls are great. They're awesome for helping get that water going everywhere. But if you don't mix them up into the entire grain bed, they're not gonna help. You need to mix them up. Same thing, but opposite direction. Flaked oats, flaked rye, flaked wheat, wheat, um, though, and even rye. Those things need to be mixed up with all the grains. If you're just putting it on a layer by layer, that layer is where the water is going to go around because it's going to be, ah, eh, stuff gets stuck. If you've ever had oatmeal and you've heated it up and then you've let it sit, I mean, too long, you can dump it out and it looks like a brick. It happens the same way in your mash bed. You need to mix that stuff up so that way it's in between the rice holes, in between the husks, and that it has good flow. You want good flow. 
don't want packed mashes. It's gonna pack down a little bit over time, but hopefully, you know, not too long. Same thing with time, time. If I do a 30 minute mash and I do a 90 minute mash and I have 90 minutes to let that water more exposed to that grain and over here I only have 30 minutes, probably gonna have a better brew house efficiency over here at 90. Now keep in mind, the longer you go, the more possibility you also have of pulling in some off flavors or some tannins that maybe you didn't want, but time. And the last little item in here, and this is for the Anvil users, and it will benefit people who aren't Anvil users. Path of least resistance. The wart's coming down and says, hey, I got a hole here. I'm going out. Versus down here. Path of least resistance. Anvil sells a small batch adapter. I've already proven it in one of the videos before. Your mileage may vary, but it helps with your brew house efficiencies by making those holes hard to get out of by kind of blocking them. And when it blocks them, it forces the flow through the rest of the grains in the bottom and doesn't allow it to say, you know, I don't like you, I'm gonna go around you today. No, it has to go through the entire grain bed or at least the area it can flow through. And that's the key, making sure that grain bed is nice and flow, you want that to flow. Number five, this one, it doesn't actually impact your brew house efficiency, but it impacts your ability to have a reliable brew house efficiency that you can compare after each brew and keep up and get a better brew house efficiency. So it does impact it, just not directly. Measuring the right expected runoff. If you're using Beersmith or any program and you're putting in the calculations, good information in, good information out, bad information in, bad information out. If I'm putting in 7.6 gallons total water, I'm expecting five and a quarter wart and I get five, my brew house efficiency is probably gonna look really good. If I get six, my brew house efficiency is probably gonna look really bad. And yes, you heard people, oh, I got over 100% brew house efficiency. Yeah, I had that happen to me. I'm not gonna bust on you. And I knew better and I went to my local brew shop and said, what the hell did I do wrong? Something missing. And yeah, bad information in, bad information out. It was many, many, many years ago, but I was when I was learning about brew house efficiencies and starting to understand how to get a little bit more out of what I was purchasing and get a little bit more fermentable sugar so I didn't need as much malt to do the same thing. Measure, measure, and adjust. If you're a little low or a little high, adjust for it so you can figure out what your brew house efficiency probably really is versus what you think it is. You want to make sure it's as close to correct as possible because Technically, it's going to be wrong, and I'll explain. Number six. <sighs> yeah, number six. Basically, the right malt in your recipe. And I'll get into another part of this, but <clears throat> when you're putting a Belgian Pilsner, and this is what I had, I had a Belgian Pilsner, and I went and bought some German Weirman Pilsner, and I put it into my recipe and I changed that Pilsner. My ABV jumped up. I was like, whoa, what just happened? Okay, it's called diastatic power. Diastatic power is the total activity or expected activity of malt enzymes that can hydrolyze the starches to fermentable sugars in those grains. Understand that something like Pilsner has a very high diastatic power, but something like a DRC or a roasted malt has zero. So don't worry about those. If it's zero, who cares? But if it's a lightly, lightly cooked malt or heated, however they want to call it, um, toast it, you might have some diastatic power and it's good to make sure you have the right brand and the right product in there. This is where I don't care if you're a professional brewer brewing thousands of gallons of beer or if you're the home brewer doing a one gallon batch your brew house efficiencies are never going to be 100%. They might get as close to 99.9, .9, but they're not gonna be 100%. Reason being is for us home brewers, we may not have the information as to where that grain came from or who made that, that malt, I would say grain malt. And that's gonna shift our diastatic power a little without our knowledge, not to mention every year, you know, things happen to the farmers and this is where it impacts the big companies and the big breweries is that they didn't get enough grain from one farmer, so they got it from another, or this farmer had a bumper crop, or last year the husks were a little thicker by fractions of a millimeter, but fractions. It impacts what your diastatic power is going to be because the enzymes may be higher or lower for that malt. 
Now, from my understanding, some of these companies, when they're selling to big breweries, they're testing and giving them a number. Well, it's like snowflakes, okay? Ballpark number based on the batch they tested because this one and this one are not identical. They're gonna vary, even if it's by a billionth of a whatever, they're gonna vary a little bit. And when you're talking, I mean, hell, we'd probably drop them million little grains just in a five gallon batch or at least somewhere up there but when you're brewing thousands of gallons of beer it could be off a little in one direction or another and that little tiny bit of margin could change things a little more than they wanted it to be changed so that's something to be aware of diastatic power you're not going to have any control of that but if you can ask what's the srm what's this what's that like i used to if you get the brand and you know what type of grain it is, hopefully your application has something close. But like I'm using Beersmith and I don't know how frequently that diastatic power gets updated. I doubt it gets updated regularly. So it might be four, five, six, seven, eight years old. I don't know. I just don't know. So the key is, is if you're getting the correct information in or at least close to correct as possible, you can at least repeat the process. And although over time those grains may change a little, you should be able to at least measure against yourself and get better and better brew house efficiencies. And that's really the, the big gauge. It's not against everyone else, it's against yourself so that you can understand if you're improving or maybe not improving and get better and better at what you do. That's one of the main reasons I love home brewing is because I'm always learning and I love learning new things. So keep that in mind. Thank you again for joining us here at Bitter Reality Brewing. Don't forget, like, subscribe. Thank you again for sharing. It's greatly appreciated more than you realize. Thank you again.